Good afternoon. The next item of business is a statement by Mark MacDonald on the minimum age of criminal responsibility. The Minister will take questions at the end of his statement, so there should be no interventions or interruptions. I call on Mark MacDonald. Minister, you have ten minutes, please. Uh, presiding officer, this government is clear about the country we aspire to be. It is a Scotland that upholds the rights of its people, including children and young people, so they can play a full part in society. Our focus is on transforming the lives of our children and young people and opening the doors of opportunity to all. Our aim is to make Scotland the best place to grow up and to giving all of our young children the best possible start in life. That involves considering what more we can and should do to support our most vulnerable children and young people. That is why we recently announced a review of our care system and will update Parliament on this in due course. In the debate last week on adoption and permanence, I announced measures to help achieve secure, safe and loving homes for more children and young people more quickly. And we are leading work to improve Scotland's child protection system, including reviewing the law to ensure it provides adequate protection against all forms of abuse, neglect, violence and harm. For more than half a century, the legacy and influence of the Colbrandon Report has resonated through our children's hearing system and now underpins the getting it right for every child approach. We are rightly proud that in Scotland we continue to respond to children's deeds in the context of their needs. As our understanding of the impact of poverty, deprivation, abuse and neglect grows, we know that children and young people whose childhoods are compromised by their circumstances are also more likely to engage in risky behaviours, including those which might risk their own safety as well as others, and bring them to the attention of police and other agencies. This is backed up by recent research conducted by the Scottish Children's Reporter Administration into the backgrounds of 100 offending children under 12, which showed that three quarters had previous referrals to the Children's Reporter, one in four had been victims of physical or sexual abuse, more than half had educational issues, and more than half had previous long-standing involvement with children's services. The evidence tells us that children under 12 who engage in harmful behaviour are primary school-aged children who tend to be disadvantaged, victimised and vulnerable through no fault of their own. We have already acted to address this by raising the minimum age of prosecution. In 2010, we changed the law with support across this chamber, so no one under 12 could ever be prosecuted or sentenced in the criminal courts. This was a significant reform which has helped to ensure that children are kept out of the criminal justice system. However, those children have continued to face consequences as a result of their previous harmful behaviour, including through the disclosure of such behaviour via criminal record disclosures. Moreover, the low age of criminal responsibility in Scotland and indeed the UK has continued to attract the attention of the United Nations Committee on the Rights of the Child, including in its most recent concluding observations from August this year, which again called on UK administrations to raise the minimum age of criminal responsibility in accordance with acceptable international standards. And presiding officer, I can announce today that we will raise the minimum age of criminal responsibility in Scotland from 8 to 12 years and we will introduce a bill in this session to do so. The establishment of the advisory group last year by the Cabinet Secretary for Justice was a necessary and sensible step to examine in detail the implications of raising the age to 12. I thank all of the members of the group for sharing their knowledge and insight. The group looked at four key areas. The management of risk in relation to children's behaviour, changes which may be required to the children's hearing system, police powers and issues in relation to disclosure certificates, and the weeding and retention of non-conviction information. The advisory group represented a wide range of disciplines, including those working with children and with victims, as well as the police and the Crown Office. It reported in March 2016 with a number of recommendations which we have consulted on. That consultation ran from March to June, with 95% of all respondents supporting an increase in the minimum age of responsibility to 12 or above. This overwhelming support was across the board, including statutory agencies such as the police, organisations which support victims of crime and charities which support vulnerable children. We also undertook engagement over the summer with key groups likely to be affected by any change in the law, including young people themselves. Throughout June and July, we listened to more than 200 children and young people, including those whose childhood experience has resulted in early contact with the criminal justice system, as well as those that have been victims of child offending. I want to thank them all for taking part, for sharing their experiences and providing valuable insight into this issue. Presiding officer, we have taken time to consider the content and implications of the advisory group's report, the springtime consultation and the summer engagement results, along with the lessons of data and independent research. The case for change is now clear and compelling, but it is important we address remaining concerns that some might have 
from changing the law. There must be appropriate safeguards to deal with not only exceptional cases, but to all types of cases for under 12s, especially where policing agencies don't get cooperation from parents and carers. We therefore intend to bring forward a bespoke package of police powers to ensure that the police can investigate harmful behaviour involving children under 12 so that all necessary steps can be taken to keep them and others safe. We also intend to ensure that there are powers to allow police to seek a warrant to take forensic samples to investigate an incident where a young person, their parent or carer has not provided consent. To ensure the protection of other children and vulnerable adults, it will remain possible to disclose relevant information relating to serious incidents involving a child under 12. This disclosure process will provide the right balance between the best interests of the individual and the need to protect the public from harm. Where young people have demonstrated harmful behaviour in early childhood and continue to do so as they move to adulthood, specific arrangements to manage and monitor risk will be put in place. I want to assure members that raising the minimum age of criminal responsibility will not remove the need to maintain the current range of interventions used to address harmful and risk-related behaviour by children. These include our successful whole system approach to youth justice and compulsory supervision through the children's hearing system. That includes the power to place a child in secure accommodation if considered necessary to protect the child or the public. The advisory group rightly required to consider how the exceptional cases might be dealt with if the age of criminal responsibility was increased. While the James Bulger tragedy 23 years ago continues to cast a long shadow, it is important to note that there has been no similar Scottish case in that time. The possibility of serious cases has to be contemplated, but should not distort our overall approach. Sensible and proportionate safeguards will be put in place to address these cases. As the law currently stands, if a child under 12 killed someone, he or she would not be prosecuted in court, but instead referred to the children's hearing system on offence grounds, with lifelong disclosure of the offence applying. However, in future, such a case would still be referred to the hearing system without reliance on finding offence grounds proved, but with all the current powers and interventions remaining available. Civil disclosure into adulthood would continue to be possible and will occur when there is a compelling justification to protect the public. Action taken to manage risks posed by young people who have shown a capacity for harmful behaviours will integrate seamlessly with the steps that are already available to manage risks posed by those over 18. It is important to place the proposed change in context. Over the past 10 years, there has been a large and sustained reduction in youth crime referrals. The number of children under 12 involved in harmful behaviours is small and reducing. Only a handful require compulsory measures of supervision. Across Scotland in 2015-16, approximately four under 12s each week were referred to the reporter for offending, a tenth of what it was 10 years ago and a quarter of what it was five years ago. As we take forward this reform, it is vital we address the impact of changing the law on the victims of children's harmful behaviour. To be clear, the harm caused to victims, who may themselves be children, will not be changed or undone by raising the minimum age of criminal responsibility. The needs of victims must continue to be met. Indeed, changing the law could offer a positive benefit to vulnerable victims. Victim Support Scotland's view is that dealing with harmful behaviour using the civil standard of proof through non-offence grounds would enable facts to be established without the need for victims and witnesses to give evidence directly. This would minimise the impact on victims and witnesses. Presiding officer, I know that many members will welcome this change in the law, and I look forward to, welcome, to working with them to deliver that. But I acknowledge that some will be concerned at the change in its impact. What should reassure them is that children and young people want this. Victims groups want it. Police and prosecutors want it. And the United Nations has called on us to do it. We can sustain and build public confidence by anticipating and addressing the questions posed by the sort of exceptional cases I have referred to, but we should not lose sight of the fact that these are very rare. This reform signals our commitment to a smart, evidence-led and rights-proofed approach. It marks a major step forward in fulfilling a promise to our own young people, to be genuine corporate parents by treating them as children first and acknowledging that in most cases, it is unmet needs which give rise to harmful deeds. Presiding officer, we have listened to children's experiences. We have considered the evidence. We have taken on board the views of victims and the expertise of justice agencies, and we have a vision of the kind of Scotland we aspire to be. This is emphatically the right time and the right approach to raise the minimum age of criminal responsibility. I look forward to working with members across the chamber to deliver this reform in time for our year of young people in 2018. Well, thank you very much, Minister.
The Minister will now take questions on the issues raised in his statement. I intend to allow around 20 minutes for questions, after which we'll move on to the next item of business. Members who wish to ask a question should press the request to speak buttons now. I call first on Douglas Ross. Mr Ross. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I thank the Minister for early sight of his statement, as well as the advisory group and stakeholders who contributed to the consultation earlier this year. Their feedback has been invaluable. The Law Society have emphasised that raising the age of criminal responsibility would bring it into line with the age of criminal prosecution, and this seems a sensible approach to create coherence and consistency in the law, but we on these benches will wait to see the full details of the Government's proposed legislation. Can the Minister confirm whether the Scottish Government will introduce a standalone bill on this issue which the Law Society has recommended is the best approach? I also welcome the Minister's sensitivity over the concerns that some will have regarding this proposal to change the law. Can he advise how the Scottish Government will, as he said, sustain and build public confidence to ensure this approach will not be perceived as diminishing the seriousness of child and youth offending? And finally, the Minister highlighted the horrendous horrendous death of J.B. Bulger. And while I appreciate what he said, that these cases are extremely rare, safeguards must be in place. The Minister has mentioned these with regard to police powers, but can he confirm what other safeguards will be put in place for crimes such as this to ensure that the law continues to act as a deterrent and one that guarantees that the victims' families receive the justice they deserve? Thank you, Mr Ross. Minister. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and uh, I thank Douglas Ross for his constructive approach uh, to this issue. Um, to answer his questions in turn, in relation to whether we will have a standalone bill, the answer is yes. We will bring forward standalone legislation in relation to the minimum age of criminal responsibility. Uh, in terms of how we sustain and build public confidence, there is obviously an engagement uh, that needs to be undertaken as we progress with the legislation. That will involve both in terms of uh, our understanding of how the legislation is to be drafted uh, and then during the course of the legislation's passage as it is consulted upon. Those will provide opportunities. Now, I've been very clear uh, in my statement and would reiterate today that I want to work with members across the chamber to ensure that we deliver a package of legislation that meets not just the requirements uh, that I've set out in the statement, but also can meet the confidence of members across the chamber and also the wider public. So I can give that commitment that we will uh, work on a basis that looks to sustain and build public confidence. In relation to the safeguards, um, there were a range of safeguards uh, set out by the advisory group. It would perhaps be uh, probably stretching the presiding officer's patience for me to list them all in turn. But what I can commit to do is to place a copy of that in SPICE for all members. That doesn't necessarily mean that that is what we will take forward, but I think it provides us with a useful starting point for consideration as we look to draft for the legislation. But for example, where in exceptional circumstances there is no cooperation from parents, it would enable authorities to take a child to a place of safety, interview, obtain and potentially retain forensic samples and crave a warrant to obtain further forensic samples. Uh, those measures would be rooted in child protection procedures and powers which police already have available to them. So that perhaps gives a flavour of the kind of approach that we would seek to take. But as I've said, this is something which will be very much an iterative process uh, based on consultation across the chamber uh, as we look to draft the legislation from here. Uh, thank you, Claire Baker, to be followed by Fulton McGregor. Uh, can I thank the Minister for an advanced copy of the statement and welcome the announcement today that the minimum age of criminal responsibility will be raised to 12. From the advisory group to the consultation submissions to the Minister today, the argument has been persuasively made for such a raise and it has the support of Scottish Labour in taking this forward. Uh, the Minister will know that there is a debate around the extent of police powers. In relation to forensic samples, can he say today how long forensic information uh, will be retained? And on the issue of disclosures, can he inform Parliament if there will be independent ratification as called for by the advisory group? And um, finally, while a strong case has been made for raising the age, the government will be aware that securing public confidence can at times be difficult. And the minister mustn't underestimate the challenges there may be here. And while in his response to Mr Ross, he talked about the legislative consultation that there will be, um, I think it's important to recognise that this might not be enough. And what else is the government prepared to do to win over people's hearts and minds when it comes to this significant change? 
Thank you, Ms. Baker, Minister. Uh, well, I thank Claire Baker for, uh, first of all, outlining Scottish Labour's position of being supportive uh, in relation to this, and I look forward to working uh, with Ms. Baker and her colleagues uh, taking this forward. Uh, in relation to uh, the extent of police powers and the length of time which samples could be retained, and also in relation to independent uh, ratification around disclosures, uh, these are both questions to which I approach with an open mind uh, and would be interested to hear views not just of other members but also other experts as well. As I've said, what we have at the moment is a suggested package of powers and safeguards which the advisory group have outlined, which I will place in SPICE and provide us with, I think, a useful starting point. Uh, from that starting point, I take the view that we then need to consider what the best approaches would be in order to uh, satisfy, as Claire Baker says, uh, public concerns, uh, but also to ensure that children's rights uh, are paramount in our considerations. Uh, in terms of the point around public confidence, I think one of the things which will help uh, in public confidence are two things. Firstly, the broad range of stakeholders, including Victim Support Scotland, who have come forward and said that they are supportive of this measure. I think if we have groups representing victims who say that this will bring benefit, not just in terms of the approach to those children who are coming into the hearing system, but also to those victims uh, who will not fi find themselves being put through potentially having to give evidence directly. Uh, that will help to give confidence. I think what will also give confidence is if we as a chamber are speaking in a supportive manner on this and taking that message out to communities and demonstrating that there is broad pub political support which can help to derive broad public support as well. But I don't underestimate that there will be those who have concerns and I'm keen to ensure that we address those uh, in as many ways as we possibly can. Thank you. I have 10 members uh, wishing to ask questions. So as usual, if I could have short questions and if possible, short answers where appropriate. Fulton McGregor to be followed by Margaret Mitchell. Mr McGregor. Thank you, President Officer. I welcome the increase in the age of criminal responsibility, which I believe is a progressive step, bringing Scotland into line with other European nations. Can the Minister give further detail on why the decision has been made to set the age of criminal responsibility at 12? What evidence there is that this is the most appropriate age and how changing the law will contribute to the Scottish Government's desired outcomes for children? Minister. Uh, well, there are a number of factors taken into account in making this decision. Uh, firstly, the age of 12 aligns with the current minimum age of prosecution. Uh, it also meets international expectation from the UN, uh, and it reflects the age at which children are presumed to have capacity to instruct a solicitor, uh, as well as existing presumptions around maturity, rights and participation in the children's hearing system. Uh, the proposed approach is founded on clear evidence, including the research I highlighted from the Scottish Children's Reporter Administration uh, about the vulnerable backgrounds of many uh, under 12s who engage in harmful behaviour. Uh, the issues do become more complex when children over 12 are involved, with the risk of harm both to themselves and others greater and often higher number of offences involved. And changing the law allows us to continue to embed the GERFEC approach uh, into how we support the needs of our most vulnerable children, uh, considering the whole needs of children and making that our focus. So I do recognise that there are some who have called for the age to be raised higher than 12, but I consider we have the balance right and should be guided by the evidence we've gathered from the substantial engagement on this issue. Thank you, Margaret Mitchell, mm -hmm. followed by Christine McKelvey. Ms. Mitchell. Um, whilst the children's hearing system already deals with cases as appropriate and low numbers of referrals demonstrate that 8 to 11 year olds are only held criminally responsible in exceptional cases, if the age of criminal responsibility is to be raised to 12, can the Minister confirm that children's hearing system and any um, secure accommodation required be, is to be appropriately and properly resourced to deal with any exceptional cases which have involved recognised crime such as murder, serious and violent offences committed by the under 12. Minister. Uh, well, I thank Margaret Mitchell for her question. Uh, she will be aware uh, of the ongoing work around the Children's Hearing Improvement Programme. Uh, and I have a meeting later this afternoon with Children's Hearing Scotland, where I will be uh, discussing with them uh, that programme, but also obviously the implications of this statement will be discussed in that meeting as well. Um, we are currently undertaking uh, a, a, an approach which is looking at the, the skills uh, of panel members uh, and the approaches that are taken within children's hearings. Um, but to put some of this into context, if we take the 2015-16 uh, data that we have available to us, the total number of referrals to the panel were 210. Uh, the number number of hearings that took place on offence grounds were six. So the number of referrals 
does not necessarily relate to the number of hearings which actually take place uh, in relation to offence grounds. So we are talking about exceptionally small numbers here. So while I recognise the resource question that Margaret Mitchell has highlighted, it is worth reflecting on the numbers that we are actually talking about when we look at referrals versus those where hearings actually take place. And then beyond that, where compulsory measures take place is very often much lower than those which are actually referred in the first place. Thank you. Christina McKelvey, to followed by Mary Fee. Ms McKelvey. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I welcome the Minister's announcement today. It's a move which, in my view, is long overdue. And the Minister will be aware that if we want to achieve that fairer Scotland that he highlighted in which children are treated equally, embedding the UN Convention of the Rights of the Child in all relevant policy areas is key. So can the Minister advise whether our child rights-focused approach was taken when exploring this issue, the implications of changing the law for children and how that will, will and was achieved? Minister. I thank uh, Christina McKelvey for that question and I can confirm that yes, this uh, approach was taken very much from a children's rights proofed uh, perspective. Um, a child rights and wellbeing impact assessment was commissioned as part of the review. Uh, I'm happy to arrange alongside the advisory group recommendations which I committed to Douglas Ross would be placed in SPICE to have that document also placed in SPICE so that members can uh, be reassured that a child rights agenda was absolutely at the heart of this uh, when we took it forward. Thank you, Mary Fee, followed by John Finney. Ms Fee. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and can I too thank the Minister for an advanced copy of his statement. As the Minister is aware, I have a keen interest in children and families affected by imprisonment, and the advisory group points out that children who get involved in serious harmful behaviour do so because of a range of difficulties in their home lives, including parental imprisonment. What actions will the government take in line with their statement today to support children with such difficulties to prevent them from negative outcomes, including imprisonment in later childhood and adult life? Minister. Well, I thank Mary Fee uh, for that question and I recognise her long-standing interest uh, in the area that she highlights. And I think uh, Mary Fee touches perhaps on areas which sit outside uh, what I've referred to in my statement, but nonetheless are uh, just as important and just as crucial. Um, in relation to the approaches that we want to take, um, I'm very heartened by a lot of the good work that is being done through our prison system currently in relation to uh, the approach being taken to, first of all, empower those parents who are imprisoned to ensure that they continue to play a positive role in their children's lives, uh, both from the position of being in prison when their children come to visit, but also upon release as well. And also the approach that is being taken to try and support children to better understand the nature of the justice system, particularly when it relates to parental incarceration. So there is a lot of good work that is being done out there. I think part of that is about joining that work up and making it more widespread. And I'm absolutely uh, happy to work with Mary Fee in relation to that, given her uh, depth of knowledge and interest in this subject. Thank you, John Finney. To be followed by Liam MacArthur, Mr. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, Officer. I, I thank the Minister for her early sight of the report and the evidence-based content which uh, the Green Party will support the direction of travel on, particularly with regard to the UN rights of the child, which is very welcome. Um, the, Minister, the report talks about bespoke police powers and experience uh, of police officers is very challenging to deal with young people, uh, particularly young people in uh, offending situations. Uh, and experience elsewhere with domestic violence and child protection has shown the benefit of collaborative working with third, across agencies and with the third, third sector. Will there be a training package put in place in support of any legislation that's forthcoming that will ensure that that best practice of cross-party, um, uh, inter-agency and um, third uh, sector working continues? Minister. I think John Finney highlights an important point in that uh, we have to ensure that the uh, appropriate approaches are taken in relation to the children who are going to be involved. Um, as I've said, um, we start from the basis of taking an open mind. Um, we have uh, a list of recommendations from the advisory group which give us, I think, a starting point but that is not the end point and there will be discussion to be had. Uh, I'm interested in the points that Mr Finney raises and uh, where there are good examples of that interagency working, we should definitely try and ensure that that is something which happens uh, across all areas rather than perhaps happening in pockets. So uh, happy to work with Mr Finney and look at those examples uh, as part of this process. Thank you, Liam MacArthur, followed by Gil Patterson, Mr MacArthur. Thanks. 
Thank you very much, Deputy President Officer. Can I too thank the Minister for early sight of his statement? Warmly welcome the decision uh, to move ahead with raising the age of criminal responsibility and look forward to working with him on the detail of that. I think he perhaps could have taken time to acknowledge the pivotal contribution of my former colleague, Alison McInnes, whose amendments to the Criminal Justice Bill led very directly to the establishment of the advisory group, whom I thank, and whose recommendations the government is now rightly taking forward. Uh, in this, this in relation to those proposals, can the Minister advise how the powers in relation to disclosure will avoid undermining efforts to address concerns of many campaigners that the actions of a child aged 8 to 11 will result in that child having a record that follows them into adulthood perhaps uh, for the rest of their life and can the minister also advise the chamber on whether his proposals will have any retrospective effect for those who have a record based on actions or behavior that took place when they themselves were between the ages of 8 and 11 thank you minister uh, well, first of all, um, can I uh, agree with Liam MacArthur and put on record my gratitude to Alison McInnes for the work that she undertook in the last Parliament uh, in relation to this. I know uh, that Liam MacArthur will understand that the reason why the Government chose not to accept Alison McInnes's amendment uh, was on the basis that the advisory group's work was ongoing, and I think we all received letters from the Children's Commissioner to that effect, asking us to allow the advisory group to conclude its work. But I do put on record uh, my thanks to Alison McInnes. She's somebody who I think this Parliament uh, misses greatly. Um, while she and I were often in disagreement, I never had occasion to find her disagreeable. Um, in relation to how uh, we take matters forward in relation to uh, both the uh, powers around disclosure and also retrospective effect, in exceptional circumstances, um, the disclosure via what would be classes other relevant information uh, would be possible. Um, but that would be uh, essentially uh, taken forward probably in exceptional circumstances depending upon seriousness of offence. Uh, but again, this is work that has to be undertaken to ensure that we get that uh, balance absolutely right. In terms of the retrospective effect, I think we need to give that some careful consideration uh, in relation to whether it is uh, possible uh, and also what the outcome of that might potentially be uh, in relation to some of those, uh, as I've identified, potentially serious cases uh, which exist out there. So uh, I'm happy to look into those matters. And again, uh, as part of the work that I want to do across the chamber, happy to discuss further with Mr MacArthur as we take forward the legislation. Thank you. Gil Patterson, followed by Gordon Lindhurst. Mr. Many Patterson. thanks, Presiding Officer. Uh, can the Minister give any further detail on what arrangements will be put in place to ensure monitoring and risk management for young people who have demonstrated harmful behaviour in early childhood offending and who continue to cause concern as they become adults? Minister. Yeah, well, children can and do change. Um, that's fundamental to the Scottish concept of social education and our reintegrative model. Um, and as I outlined in my statement, uh, we need a system which reflects that and furthers our approach to addressing needs as well as deeds. So for young people nearing their 18th birthday, um, appropriate plans should be in place to manage risks, uh, ensure these are shared with all relevant agencies with responsibility for supporting that young person and managing any potential risks uh, as they are currently. Um, additional safeguards will be put in place for a young person moving into young adulthood whose behaviour has been assessed to continue to be a source of serious concern and where compulsory measures of risk management are considered necessary and proportionate. So that is the principle on which we begin uh, in relation to this uh, and again it's work that will be taken forward as part of the legislation being drafted. Thank you Gordon Linters. We fall back Ian Gray. Mr Linters. A very small number of children can be guilty of conduct of the most serious kind. The question in the public mind will be, if they are capable of serious criminal conduct, why should they not be dealt with on the basis of that conduct? Now, my question, and I wonder if the minister could give any commitment on this today and something that may allay the fear in people's minds, is if someone, when an adult commits a crime, that uh, they have conducted themselves in a certain way that would have been criminal but for this change in the law, Will the previous conduct be taken account of for the purposes of sentencing, the sex offenders register, lifelong restriction orders, all of these issues? It may be the general principle is all the minister could commit to today, and the detail will have to follow. Yes, sir. Well, as I've said, um, in relation to exceptional circumstances, disclosure into adulthood will be a possibility. Um, in relation to the point that Mr Lindhurst makes, I think I would uh, essentially respond by saying uh, I don't think it is acceptable to essentially say that we should categorise all eight-year-olds uh, as being potential serious criminals. 
and that's the approach I take. So I recognise that we need to do some work to uh, ensure that where exceptional circumstances arise and the figures that I have given uh, this afternoon would give indication that those are exceptional circumstances. Um, I don't think we should start from the premise that we categorise all of those children aged between 8 to 12 in that manner. Um, thank you. Ian Gray, followed by Ben McPherson. Mr Gray. Uh, thank you. In a statement, the Minister explained uh, how a child who killed would be dealt with now uh, and how they would be dealt with under the proposed legislation, but he also pointed out how rare that is. With the evidence of uh, increased early sexualisation of children, a more likely case might be one of a child under 12 but over 8 who committed a sexual offence. Can the Minister elaborate how that will be dealt with and how further offending might be protected against appropriately, if necessary. Minister. Uh, well, again, um, I think this comes back to the point about the identification of the vulnerability uh, of children and the fact that the deeds uh, are dictated by those needs and by that, that situation. So in those circumstances, uh, I accept that there will need to be interventions. And as I outlined in my statement, the full range of interventions would remain available to the children's hearing system. But I also think that there is work that needs to be done uh, around the areas that Ian Gray identifies. And there is obviously work going on in other government streams to look at things like, for example, child sexual exploitation, uh, sexualization of children, and the behaviors that arise as a consequence of that. So it's about joining up those approaches to ensure that those children achieve, uh, are, are prevented from those kind of behaviours. But where those behaviours arise, firstly, they are dealt with appropriately to keep both that child and other members of the public safe, but also that we take the time to address the needs that underlie the deeds. That's a question. Ben McPherson. Thank you. In his statement, the Minister referred to a bespoke package of police powers. And I wondered if the Minister could elaborate on whether this package will give the police new powers to address harmful behaviour by children. Minister. As I outlined in my answer to uh, Mr Ross, um, many of these uh, powers are powers which the police currently have. Uh, further detailed work on this is obviously required before draft legislation is introduced and as I've said I'm keen to involve stakeholders and indeed members uh, in that work. Um, as a starting point I've said I will place the advisory group's uh, recommendations in SPICE in order to allow members to examine them in more thorough detail. But I can confirm, as I confirmed to Ms McKelvey, that a child rights and wellbeing impact assessment was commissioned as part of this process, which demonstrates that the proposals on safeguards and police powers have been rights-proofed at the design stage and that screening would continue as proposals are developed. Thank you. That concludes questions of the statement. We move on to the next item of business, but I'll allow for a few moments to the front benches to change places. Thank you.